Okay, good evening everyone. My name is Haley Dushinsky and I'm the director of the Center for Law, Justice, and Culture. It's really my pleasure to welcome all of you, Ohio University alumni, students, faculty, and administrators to the 2014 pre-law event. Tonight we have more than 20 Ohio University graduates with us, alumni who spent their college years here on the Athens campus and then went on to law school and to successful law careers in a variety of different legal fields. These alumni have come back to spend pre-law day with us. They've come from all over the country. And tomorrow they're going to be joining us for a full day of panels. Um, on law school and law careers. The panels will be tomorrow uh, starting at 9.45 in the morning on the second floor here of Baker Center. And those panels are open to the public. They're open to all students. And we really encourage you and invite you to come join us for those panels. Alumni, we're so happy to have you here with us and to take time out of your schedules to come work with Ohio University undergraduate students to help mentor and train them and inspire them to go into careers in law. Um, I'd also just like to say a few quick words about the man who made all of these events possible, uh, Larry Heyman. Larry is our new pre-law advisor for the Center for Law, Justice, and Culture. Larry, would you like to stand up and wave? Yay! As you all probably already know, Larry is himself an Ohio University um, alumnus. He graduated from the Department of Political Science, and he's also an alumnus of the um, Moritz School of Law at The Ohio State University. Larry was working in private practice for about 10 years in Columbus, and just two months ago, we lured him away here to Ohio University. He's only been with us for a short time, but he's been working absolutely tirelessly to transform the campus and to introduce so much pre-law programming for the undergraduate students here at Ohio University. Just a couple of days ago, one of my faculty colleagues sent me an email saying that he already couldn't remember a time before when Larry came and joined us here in Athens, <laughs> and it's only been two months. <laughs> so Larry, thank you so much for all the work that you've been doing this fall semester. Um, finally, I would like to also recognize two of our undergraduate student associates, Elizabeth Sikosh and Katie Conlin. I know Katie's here. Katie, where are you? There she is in back. Katie, round of applause for Katie. Lizzie will be joining us also for some of the events tonight and tomorrow. Lizzie and Katie are both uh, officers of the student organization, the Students for Law, Justice, and Culture, and they're also undergraduate research associates with the center, and they've taken the lead on so many of the powerful events that we've held um, this semester. Here's Lizzie also. Um, they've designed the posters, they've uh, written the content for the newsletters, they've managed our Facebook and Twitter accounts. Um, they've helped us decorate the office. They're also live tweeting the event tonight. <laughs> so so we, can follow, um, we can follow that on Twitter. So from all of us, Lizzie and Katie, thank you so much for everything you've been doing. Uh, but tonight, we're so absolutely honored to welcome uh, Yvette McGee Brown here with us for the keynote speech. I'll say a few words of introduction uh, for Justice McGee Brown, although I'm sure <laughs> I'm sure all of you are familiar with her biography already. Uh, Justice McGee Brown graduated from Ohio University from the Scripps College of Communications in 1982 with a degree in journalism and public relations. She continued her education at The Ohio State University, Moritz College of Law, earning her Juris Doctor in 1985. So her life has really been defined by a series of firsts. She's a first-generation college graduate, She's the first African-American woman who was elected to the Franklin County Common Pleas Court. Justice McGee Brown was elected to the Franklin County Court of Common Pleas, the Domestic Relations and Juvenile Division, in 1992. And when she left the Common Pleas bench, she founded a nationally recognized organization that really redefined how hospitals, law enforcement, and social welfare groups respond to children and families that are caught in cycles of abuse. In January of 2011, she became the first African-American woman to serve as a justice on, this, on the Ohio Supreme Court. And in January of 2013, she joined the Jones Law Firm, Jones Day Law Firm. Throughout her career, Justice McGee Brown has been an incredibly strong advocate of families and children. After joining the court, she became uh, the chair of an interagency task force focused on improving the educational outcomes for children in foster care. Justice McGee Brown is also an active board member for the Law and Leadership Institute, a collaborative program among Ohio's legal community and eight law schools. 
that gives underserved youth an opportunity to explore the law and develop their academic skills. Just as McGee Brown has been an active community and corporate leader, she served on a number of prominent boards, too many to mention here, and she's been awarded many prestigious honors, again, too many to mention. She's a former chair of the United Way of Central Ohio, the Ohio State University uh, Alumni Association, and the YWCA Columbus Board of Directors. In 2008, Justice McGee Brown was inducted into the Ohio Women's Hall of Fame, and she was recently recognized as an odds changer by the National Children's Defense Fund. Please join me in welcoming Justice McGee Brown. Thank you very much, and I'm glad that you um, chose to come forward because I really would like to have a conversation with you. Um, what I'm going to tell you is that I think being a lawyer is the best career you can have, um, but I absolutely want to answer your questions because I know it must feel pretty daunting to sit where you are, even though I've been a lawyer for 29 years. Can you believe that? 29 years. Um, I remember being where you are and thinking about going to law school, what would it be like, could I be successful, and I was terrified. But you know what, the reason I went to law school, quite honestly, started here at OU. As you heard, I was a first generation college student. I had no idea about what going to law school meant. Nobody in my family was a lawyer. Nobody in my family was a business person. My mother was a teenage single mother and she had two children after me and she worked in factories uh, during the day and then cleaned office buildings at night. So to say that I was unfamiliar with this career is an understatement. But what I was fortunate to have is that I was smart and I was willing to work hard. And so when I was in high school at Mifflin High School in Columbus, my mind was not set on going to college, honestly. It was set on my football playing boyfriend. And uh, I was being uh, probably, not probably, I was being inappropriate with him in the hallway when my guidance counselor walked by stuck her arm through mine, walked me away from him and said, you're too smart not to go to college. And for whatever reason, for whatever reason, this woman made it her business to get me to college. And she brought me and several other students down to OU for a visit. And I don't know if it was some kind of pre-college days or whatever, but we got to stay overnight and somehow we got away from her and went to a fraternity party. <laughs> And all I can tell you, and I wish I could stand here, and I'm sorry, OU, that I can't say that I came here because of your great academic reputation or because I saw how you were ranked in US News and World Report. I came here because after I went to that party, I said, man, if this is college, sign me up. I am so in. And, and OU did not disappoint. I mean, I really grew up here. I mean, I had the chance to, to develop leadership skills and to take interesting classes. Larry and I were talking about Dr. Frank Henderson, who was then in the political science department. I, I mean, Frank Henderson ignited my interest in political science. I took an entry-level political science class with him, and he was so smart, and he challenged us to think about the world, not just as it is, but how it could be. And so I started taking every class that he offered, and part of it was he was kind of cute too, so, you know, as a young student, I was like, I want to be in his class. But I was also a journalism major, and I had the good fortune of getting a woman named Sandra Haggerty as my advisor. Sandra Haggerty was this amazing African-American woman who had only moved to Athens like the year before I got there. She had gone through a divorce. She had three young daughters. She used to write a syndicated column in the LA Times. And she was the first person who looked at me and said, at the end of my sophomore year, and I don't know, you guys probably do all this online now, but when I was in school, you had to fill out this paper and go by your advisor's office and drop it in a box. And so when I go in to drop off my schedule for the next year, she looks at me and she says, what are we doing with this journalism degree? And I said, I don't know. I said, you know, I really like political science, and I think I want to go to the Hill and be like a press secretary for a congressperson. And she looked at me and she said, hmm, well, then you need to go to law school. I said, why? And she said, well, everybody in Washington is a lawyer. So if you're gonna to go to Washington, you should be a lawyer. It's three more years of your life, you'll be 25 years old, you'll have the world by a string. 
I actually thought she was crazy. I was 20 years old, and the thought of being in college till I was 25 was not appealing. And so I went home, and, and I talked to my grandmother, who was from Macon, Georgia. And uh, she grew up in the Jim Crow South, never had opportunities because of the time period in which she was born. But I go to her, and I say, you know, Granny, this, this woman is telling me I should go to law school, but who stays in school till they're 25? I mean, that's just crazy. I'm not doing three more years of college. And these are words I want you to remember. She looked at me. She actually didn't look at me. She liked to crochet, so she didn't even look up at me. She was crocheting. And she just kind of said, well, if you're going to live to be 25 anyway, why not be 25 and be a lawyer versus 25 and not? Makes sense. And so I did those three years of law school. I was 25. I graduated in May, took the bar exam in July, got sworn in in November, and it's 29 years later, and I've had an amazing career. So if you want it, you can do it, but you have to understand that it's about sacrifice, it's about rigor, it's about really buckling down for those three years and doing the best you can so that you have opportunities for employment. Because I'm going to be honest with you, the legal field is still soft right now. Because of the economy crash in 2008, 2009, a lot of older lawyers aren't leaving the profession. And so you've really got to excel. And this is what I did because I have to tell you that I was scared to death. I, I applied to, I don't know, five or six law schools. And Capital University in Columbus, I got accepted within like three weeks of applying to them. So I was like, hey, I'm in. You know, I applied in December, and by, the, by January, before the end of January, I was in of my senior year. But then I got accepted to Ohio State and Georgetown. And Georgetown was where I really wanted to go. It was in my dream city. I was going to be in D.C. I mean, I've just recently excised my Georgetown ghost because I now go back there to interview law students for jobs. But really, that was where I wanted to be. And Ohio State treated me like a professional athlete. There was a woman there named Barbara Rich. And Barbara Rich would call me every week and say, so when can we expect you at Ohio State? And I'm like, Mrs. Rich, you're very nice, but I'm going to Georgetown. And she's like, OK, I'll talk to you next week. And every time she called, she put more money on the table. So this is the other thing I want you to remember. Please, please don't go into six-figure debt. Do not go into six-figure debt for law school. If you can't find somebody who wants to pay you to come or is going to give you a scholarship or you're going to get a fellowship or something, I, I get heartbroken by the kids that come in with six-figure debt, unless you know that you're smart enough that you could end up at a firm like Jones Day where you can make a six-figure salary at 25 years old and pay off your student loans, don't straddle yourself with $150,000 or $200,000 in debt. It's like a house you never get to live in. So be smart about going to, to law school. And I'm going to tell you this. I have a young associate who is so bright, big brain. She went to Harvard undergrad and could have gone to Harvard Law School, but instead she went to UCLA, a well-ranked school, but not an Ivy. And when I asked her why she went to law school at UCLA, and she was first in her class at UCLA, she said, because UCLA was free. They gave me a full tuition scholarship, and I just wasn't going to incur Harvard debt just to have a Harvard diploma. And this young woman went from UCLA to clerk on the United States Supreme Court for Justice Stephen Breyer. And now she's a senior associate at the Jones Day Law Firm. So you have to be smart about the choices you make. And this is why I can tell you I excised my Georgetown ghost, because I was there last summer with one of my colleagues from our Chicago office, and he was a Georgetown alum. And I was telling him this story about how I so wanted to go there, but Ohio State basically gave me free tuition and, uh, tuition. and I was from Columbus, so I was living with my grandmother. So I had no debt coming from law school. And I wanted to go to Georgetown, but my mother did one of those things where she takes a piece of paper and draws a line through it and says, OK, back then Georgetown was like $10,000 a year. They were offering no money, and I'd have to live in DC. Ohio State, free tuition, you live with your grandmother. So I went to Ohio State, but I'd always wondered, what if? 
And Jose told me a similar story. He was from a family of um, lower middle class means, and he got a full ride to North Carolina um, at Chapel Hill. And his father had the same talk with him, but Jose wanted to go to Georgetown. And when he went to Georgetown, he went there because he wanted to be a prosecutor. He loved being in the courtroom. He wanted to be a prosecutor. But because he chose Georgetown, the decision to be a prosecutor was no longer there. Because he incurred such debt, he had to go work in a corporate law firm so that he could pay off his debt. So it was really like the chance for me to say, wow, I made the right decision. Because I was able to come out of school and I wanted to be a prosecutor, I wanted to be a litigator, and I was able to do that and not be worried about all this debt that I was gonna have. I did have debt from undergrad, but not from law school. So you have to think about that. Think about what it is you wanna do and what you wanna do with your law degree, it may change over time. You may think you wanna go in and be a prosecutor now. Very few people go to law school saying, I wanna be a corporate lawyer, woo -hoo! Because you, <laughs> you know, it's a lot of reading, it's transactional work, and unless you have a lawyer in your family, most people really aren't familiar with it. But once you get to law school, you find out you have an aptitude for it, you do well in it, and it's a great living. The one thing that gets me excited, though, when I talk about the law is that <laughs> I have so many people that like to tell lawyer jokes. I'm going to give you a joke to say because, you know, people always talk about lawyers and, you know, they, they think that we're not honorable people and our profession isn't honorable. And particularly if you happen to be around anybody who is a med student or a physician, they like to get puffed up because, you know, they're going to be a doctor, they're going to be saving lives, and what are you going to be doing? This is my favorite line I always say to them, you know what? We were writing the Constitution when you guys were putting leeches on people. So don't talk to me about honorable professions. We are the smarter ones. So just remember that. <laughs> being, a, <laughs> being a lawyer is one of those things that I think if you do, and this is, this is really important to understand, that if you really are passionate about the law, if you are really passionate about upholding rights or making sure that contracts are enforced or whatever it is, the law is one of those great professions that can serve you throughout all of the different periods of your life, right? Because what excites me about the law is when I think about the Constitution. Think Think about a group of men, a group of men in 1787 at the Constitutional Convention, lawyers who crafted this simplistic document that has now survived 227 years, a document that isn't a large document, it is brilliant in its simplicity, and it's a document that we have been able to apply to things the framers never could have thought of. When you think back on that time period, it's interesting because they wrote concepts like all men are created equal at the same time that many of them were slaveholders. And yet the hypocrisy of their position wasn't lost on most of them. They just decided that they would let somebody else deal with it because they were trying to hold a very young democracy together. And think about that. I mean, you go to Europe and you get a real sense of how young our country really is. 227 years. That is not a very long time. And yet we are the great experiment that worked because we had lawyers. Interestingly, Thomas Jefferson was opposed to having a judicial branch of government. He thought the executive and legislative branch was enough. He didn't think we needed a judicial branch because the judicial branch would twist and turn the laws to their own making. He even said it would be like wax in their hands. But Alexander Hamilton, to his credit, really pushed to have a judiciary because he said laws without checks and balances are really no laws at all. And so he really pushed and his position sustained the day. And why is that important? Because think back to this. We had a constitution that they signed in 1787 that said all men are created equal. They, many of them, were slaveholders. You get to 1896, 100 years later, slavery has been abolished, but black people still don't have rights. You go to the United States Supreme Court, and the United States Supreme Court in Plessy versus Ferguson says that segregation is the law of the land, that black people have no rights that white people must respect, and as long as it was separate but equal, the Constitution was in place. Now. 
I give you that example because I'm going to tie it up for you a little later because this is the power of lawyers. You know, I hate when people talk about activist judges and strict constructionist judges because all that means is whether they decided the case the way you thought it should be decided. Because if they decided your way, they were applying the Constitution. If they didn't decide it your way, they were activists. Because I'm going to tell you that in 1896, there were no words in the Constitution that said separate but equal. No words. And yet, instead of the country erupting in riots or internal conflict like we see going on in other parts of the world now, there were a group of lawyers who decided okay, they said that it was separate but equal, and we are going to challenge them on that. And so they started a 50-state strategy to challenge the United States on its constitutional holding that separate but equal was the law of the land. Because what they understood very clearly is governments could maintain two separate schools, but they could not make them equal. And so they started in Maryland and went across the country until 56 years later they got to Brown versus the Board of Education. That was lawyers doing that. It took a little longer. It probably didn't feel as satisfying as going to war, but it was lawyers making the country live up to the Constitution and using evidence to show, using evidence to show that separate could never be equal. That's what lawyers do. That's what we do every day in lower courts. That's what we do when we're functioning in Congress and in the halls of government. It is lawyers that upholds the rights of the few against the passions of the many. That's what makes being a lawyer one of the best things that you can do. And even coming forward today, and then I'll move off the Constitution in a second, but think about this today. In 2011, in 2011, the United States Supreme Court unanimously decided in a case called Jones versus the United States that the police could not put a GPS device on your car without probable cause and a warrant. Now, what were they interpreting? The Fourth Amendment. The framers of our Constitution in 1787 could never have envisioned a GPS system. They could never have thought about an internet, yet the concepts that they put in that document allowed a court in 2011 to apply those concepts of unreasonable government intrusion to a case where the police were just walking by and they think, oh, you look suspicious, let me slap that GPS device under your car and see where you go. Now, when I was on the Supreme Court, we had an Ohio version of Jones versus the United States, and we were looking at the Ohio Constitution at the same time that Jones' case was in the United States Supreme Court. And for your generation, you're going to address privacy issues that we haven't even begun to think about. I was at a board meeting the other day, and they were showing how they were doing, showing us how technology is increasing and how we have to keep up with technology. And they showed this clip of Katie. Kirk and Bryant's Gumbel in 1994. In 1994, 20 years ago, the internet did not exist. It was just beginning. They showed this clip of Bryant Gumbel saying, what's that little funny symbol there? Literally off the Today Show, in 1994, we were not using the internet. So what, what are you going to have 20 years from now that the law has to keep up with because think about all of the information you freely give access to, to others about you. When you swipe that little savings card at the grocery store or to CVS, that tells them everything you purchased. If you go to the doctor, I went to the doctor recently and the nurse was saying, huh, when did you start taking this? And I said, how do you know I'm taking that? She said, oh, it's your insurance. We get a list of all your medications you take. I didn't, give the, I didn't know I gave them that authority because I was seeing another doctor. But because they have my social security number and these electronic medical records, they can track everything that you do. And so you're going to grapple with those issues of the Fourth Amendment and decide where the lines of privacy should be drawn for you. That's what makes being a lawyer exciting. And so what did the United States Supreme Court say? They said you have to have probable cause from a detached magistrate and a warrant issued before you 
you can put a GPS device on somebody's car. When we had oral arguments on that exact issue, I remember asking the prosecutor for this particular law enforcement agency, why didn't you just go get a warrant? And he said, well, first, we didn't think we need to, and second, we didn't know if we had enough evidence. Living up to the Constitution and protecting individuals from unreasonable searches and seizures by the government is something that your generation will need to grapple with, and it's what makes lawyers so important. So understand this. If you decide to go to law school, there is a place for you if you want to practice law. But I also would say this. If you don't know if you want to be a lawyer, I also think it's the best graduate degree you can have. If you're going to spend two years getting an MBA, spend one more year and get a law degree. It's going to give you far more versatility. In many law schools, including The Ohio State, Moritz College of Law, you can get a combined MBA and JD. You do four years instead of three. But a law degree gives you one, it gives you that instant stamp of credibility because people know that you've been through rigorous study. They know that once you've passed the bar exam, you have the ability to analyze facts. They understand that you operate at a higher level than just someone who has a bachelor's degree. You can use it in business. You can use it as a trial lawyer. You can use it in a big corporate law firm. You can use it as an entrepreneur to start your own business. But it is the best training because of its rigor, its analysis, and the way that it teaches you to think. My first day in law school, I'll never forget the dean, and, and hopefully they don't do this anymore because it's terrifying. The dean had us all sit in, in convocation, 225 of us, and he gave this speech, and at the end he said, now look to your left, look to your right, one of you will not be here at the end of the year. I was terrified. I knew he was talking about me. But I also knew that fear can be a great motivator, and so I was just willing to work harder, just like each of you will be. But don't go to law school just because you need something to do. And be honest with yourself about the commitment you're willing to make for the next three years. That LSAT score becomes very important. If you're going to take the LSAT, I highly recommend you go through a, a bar review course or an LSAT course, because I think it's hugely important to improving your score, and that determines what schools you get into, and that determines whether or not they want to give you money. But think about what it is you want to do, whether you want to commit three years to doing it, and please don't strap yourself with debt in order to do it. Does that sound fair? You're all staring at me like, stop talking. Okay. So what I want you to do is to ask me questions that I perhaps haven't answered. Because I've, I've taken you all the way back to 1896. I've brought you forward to 2011. And hopefully in 2014, we'll have the United States Supreme Court decide marriage equality. That would be great. I, just, I, so I had some young people ask me recently, because I'm kind of a disillusioned Democrat, and, and they, <laughs> they asked me um, what it is that, that I thought government could do better. And I said, they can get out of my doctor's office and out of my bedroom. I think that if government really wants to do what's right for people, let's focus on jobs and the economy, because that's what you run on. After you deal with jobs and the economy, you should be done. You shouldn't tell me what my doctor can do, and you shouldn't tell me who I can sleep with. So until government gets that way, I'm going to continue to be disillusioned. Questions? No questions? Why do you want to be, oh good. Uh, so, so first of all, uh, thank you for coming today, uh, Justice McGee Brown, I appreciate that, obviously. Um, so I have two questions. The first one is kind of a, a personal question, mm -hmm. and then the second one is sort of like a, a general question about like law and how mm -hmm. you see law developing in the future. So. The first question would be, so I've always, you, you talked about how it was your ambition to be a, a, a press secretary on Capitol Hill. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what I've always seen myself doing, not a press secretary, but I, I spent this last summer as an intern um, in, for Congressman Stivers here. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I've sort of always wanted to do. So I'm curious, like what led you away from that direction, I guess? What led you away from Washington? From, you know, um, once I got, went to law school, I fell in love with the courtroom. I, I, um, 
I really wanted to be in D.C. That's why I had to excise that, that uh, ghost. I, you know, you always wonder about the road not taken, but I fell in love with the courtroom. And this is what can happen. This is the power of educators who are in the room. When I was a second year law student, I had this evidence professor named Harriet. And I don't know her last name because she wouldn't let us call her by her last name. She was four foot 11 and she had been a prosecutor in Brooklyn. And she was like one of those jumping beans, you know? And she said to us, she said, I want you to have a job that makes you jump out of bed in the morning, that gets you so excited you can't wait to run to the office, where you really feel like you're doing justice. That's what I want for each of you. That's what the law is. And she would say this over and over in class as she would talk about these difficult cases. And I went to work at the prosecutor's office, and that's where I wanted to be. I mean, I felt like being right there with the people, I was really their sense of justice, that I could really make things better. And it's why I ran to be a trial court judge, because the further you get away from the people, the less you get that self-satisfaction of feeling like you really made a difference. And I think Congress would have probably driven me crazy. I don't know one that I'd like campaigning every two years. And I don't, as I said to somebody, um, Franklin County got a new congressional seat a few years ago and somebody asked me if I was interested and I said, I didn't like being one of seven. I'm not gonna like being one of 435. So <laughs> I think that you, there, there's a special skill to being in Congress and if you've got that, like Steve Stivers is a good congressperson, being a good congressperson, though, means you have to be willing to stand for what you know is right, not get swept into ideology. We don't need any more ideological politicians. We really need people that put the country first. And I'm hoping your generation is going to do a better job than we have in the last 20 years. Okay. Um, so thank you. Um, and then the second question I have is, so you talked about you know the, the Constitution um, having still having relevance today and being able to be applied to these issues, and you talked about the Fourth Amendment and privacy concerns. Um, I guess my question there is, do you think there are limits to that? Um, do you think there are limits to how far we can use the sort of words of the framers of the Constitution to answer modern questions? I do not. I think that's what makes the document brilliant. I think that those concepts are living, breathing concepts. And even though we're applying them to things today that could not have been imagined in 1787, I still think that they have life and breath. This is what concerns me, though, and, and we saw a little bit of it after 9-11, um, and then we moved back to the center. Whenever we feel scared as a country, we pull in. And, and we start to think that the police power and government power is more important because it protects us. I mean, it's what we did to the Japanese during World War II. We took a whole group of people, for no other reason they were Japanese Americans, and put them in internment camps. I hope that we never give in to that fear. That's what makes me excited to be a lawyer because there are people who are fighting that even, you know, fighting that kind of discrimination on the ground that are upholding what they consider to be the lawful principles of this country. That's what lawyers do. And we're going to be like other countries that we see around the world if we give up on the rule of law. America's not perfect, but what's great about us is that even when we disagree, we do it in a way that's lawful. We don't have internal wars. We don't start throwing over our democracies. We respect the rule of law. You may have episodic situations like what's happening in Ferguson right now, but you know why that's happening in Ferguson? Because they had 13% of their people turn out to vote. And I'm sorry, democracy is a participatory sport, okay? <laughs> you can't complain about the people in office if you don't turn out to vote for them. And so, no, I hope, that, I hope the Constitution never becomes a document that we can't interpret. I think the framers were brilliant. I mean, they could have written in, you know, you can't do this. But what they wrote in were principles because they had lived under the tyranny of a king. They understood these important concepts that if, if you don't put constraints on government, people can be brought up for charges without knowing the witnesses or the evidence against, against them. Taxes can be imposed without you having the right to vote on them. Property can be taken. It was in that rubric that they made these concepts so that now we can still apply them. 
Other questions? Yes. Right here. Uh, hi, David. Um, I, uh, I'm just kind of curious from your background, uh, your a journalism communication background, at least when you started, that's what I'm doing as well now. Uh -huh. And I'm pretty certain that I don't want to go to law school specifically. I haven't mm -hmm. ruled it out, but I'm pretty sure I don't want to go to law school. <laughs> but I am interested in having a hand and having a say in advocacy when it comes to the law mm -hmm. and having a say in maybe the public dialogue about how we can shape law to protect the, to protect the rights of more Americans mm -hmm. and basically work along that um, course of action, just advocacy. Um, do you have any, any advice for someone who's just looking into that type of thing? Uh, sure. I mean, journalism is a great vehicle for doing that, right? They, they call journalism the fourth estate, right? You're, journalists are the people that look behind the curtains. Um, it doesn't happen so much anymore, and it scares me what we call journalism. I still have a 17-year-old at home, and he thinks if it's on the Internet, it's true. And so, <laughs> and so, so real journalists, I think, provide just what you say. You can be a columnist who advocates a particular position, but a, a, a good journalist is somebody who really looks not just at what people are saying, but what they do, and they get the backstory to make sure that people are doing things with integrity and not for personal benefit. They are doing things to serve the country or their constituency. So if you see yourself being more of an advocate, I think journalism is a great career for you because you could be that person, that fly in the ointment that keeps people from presenting one face to the public and, and doing something else behind the scenes. Do not go to law school unless you have real passion about it, because it is, uh, it's three, I, I cannot overstate for you how rigorous law school is. <laughs> it, it is a lot of reading. I mean, my reading speed must have tripled my first year of law school. I mean, you're literally reading 100 pages a night, doing little briefing memos so you can be prepared. I cried one time in law school, and that was in a tax class uh, with Michael Rose. Um, because I'd made a decision I wasn't going to study tax because I had all this other stuff to do and I had to brief these cases. And it's a nightmare, and, and I think they still do it this way. It's a nightmare to have a professor call on you and you're not prepared because they stick with you the entire period. And you're sitting there, you know, thinking, oh, my God, everybody thinks I'm stupid. But you just, you just, you had to make decisions, and that happened to me in Michael Rose's class. And he could see the tears streaming down my face. He did not give me a break. He stuck with me the whole hour. And after that, I made a decision. If I didn't, I wasn't going to sleep. I was going to be prepared for every class. <laughs> so only do it if you have passion for it. Hi. Um, I guess my question would be, since you've probably seen tons and tons of trials, what separates a good lawyer from a great lawyer? Hmm. What separates a good lawyer from a great lawyer? That's interesting. Um, well, a good lawyer is somebody who has the technical skills, right? They, they know how to try a case. They know how to cross-examine witnesses. They know how to put evidence on and, and to represent their client. A great lawyer typically has those skills that you can't teach. A great lawyer is that lawyer that connects with the jury, that, that has that personality that makes people want to believe them, that they have this way of not only representing their client, of not only having the technical skills, but being a persuader, that they give off that sense of authenticity and people believe them or they want to believe them, and, and that makes it um, easier for them to persuade the jury. Some, some of those skills you can't teach. Um, it, there are some people like, um, say what you will about Bill Clinton, but he is a masterful politician. And if you've ever been around him, he it has this way of looking at you like for those 30 seconds, you are the most important person in the world. <laughs> that really is a natural gift. And so great lawyers take their natural gifts and apply them uh, to their work. Uh, just. Um uh, wanted to ask this question. Uh, you were on the Ohio Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have a, when you were on the Supreme Court, did you have a life outside of that or was that everything? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, I did have a life outside of it. Um, 
But because I was campaigning the entire two years I was on the Supreme Court to hold my seat, um, it, <laughs> it wasn't much of a life. I was going around the state. I was, I was meeting lots of people. But yes, it, it's a good life. Um, it was when you like the people you work with, and when you're a trial court judge, you don't get to consult with other judges, so it can kind of be lonely when you're having to make a difficult decision. But when you're one of seven, there's a lot of give and take and opinions where you're trying to persuade the other person, and I really enjoyed that, that kind of really testing people's theories of the law to see if you agree with them or trying to get them to agree with your view. So yeah, it was a good life. The money's not great, um, which every time I say that, you know, people go, well, gosh, you make $141,000 a year as a Supreme Court justice. Yeah, but I've been a lawyer for almost 30 years. I, I make way more than that now. So, <laughs> so when they say it's public service, it is public service and sacrifice. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. Um, okay, so being able to say that you were the first African-American woman on the Ohio Supreme Court is a pretty amazing feat. Um, I just wanted to know, what did that feel like for you in the moment, and have you had the opportunity to reflect on that kind of accomplishment? <coughs> um, <coughs> yeah, that's a good question. <coughs> in the moment, it felt, um, it, was, it was very humbling because uh, people who, who have heard me speak hear me speak a lot about my grandmother and um, she was such a powerful influence on my life. And, you know, she was born in 1906 on a sharecropper's plantation in Macon, Georgia. And at the time um, where I was taking the oath, I, I thought about her and how proud she would be because she got cancer my third year of law school. And so she was diagnosed with cancer in April. They told her she shouldn't come to my graduation because she couldn't walk up all those steps at Mershon. But she said she was coming and, and she was walking up every one of those steps. And because we lived together, I got to spend those last three years with her. And she was a woman who, um, despite some of the injustices that she dealt with, was always so positive about life. I mean, she would always say to me, when I was a little kid, which is, is why I think I did so well in school, she would always say to me, you go to school and you learn everything those people have to teach you because once they've taught it to you, they can never take it away. And she would always just, you know, tell me about the power of education. And so I passed the bar, I was sworn in on November 4th, 1985, she was there, and she died on Christmas Day, 1985. And so in the moment, with my kids standing there and my husband, I wish she could have been there. I think she would have been um, so proud. Um, but I don't walk around going, I was the first African American woman on the Supreme Court. You know, <laughs> it, it's something that um, I'm proud that I'll always be part of Ohio's history. And I, I hope that I'm not the last African-American woman on the Supreme Court because the reality is when I took the, the seat, there had not been an African-American or any person of color on the court for 37 years. We are a big, diverse state. We should have a lot of different representations on the court. And so um, that, that's my only regret at losing. I will tell you that when the governor first asked me about um, taking the appointment, I initially said no. And for the, the students that are here, I think it's important for you to always be willing to stretch yourself. You know, sometimes we don't raise our hand and we don't go out for something because we think that, you know, we're not good enough or what if I don't get it? Never give in to that. Never give in to that. If you look at my bio, I think this is my eighth job in 29 years because I've always been open to trying new things and to going for the experience, which I think you have to do. But when the governor asked me, I initially said no. And I remember a girlfriend and I went out for drinks and I was telling her, you know, the governor wants me, wants me to take this appointment. I just don't think it's a good idea. I mean, I'd have to campaign statewide and what if I lose and I'm on these corporate boards right now. I gotta take a 60% salary cut, <laughs> you know. Why, why would I ever do this? And she looked at me and, and everybody should have a friend that pushes them out of their comfort zone. She looked at me and she said, so tell me what it is you can do now 
that you wouldn't be able to do as a former Supreme Court justice. And I was like, oh, gets us right. And she was right. I mean, within a week after I lost the election, I had three law firms calling me, two headhunters, one about being the dean of a law school, the other about running a nonprofit, and I've since gotten back on two corporate boards. So, you know, I just picked my life up and went on. And yet, if I hadn't said yes to that experience, I would have lost the chance to be part of the highest court in the state of Ohio for two amazing years. So I have no regrets about it. It was an awesome experience and I'm doing okay, so. Up here. And then I think there was somebody over here too. Okay, yes. Hi, um, Hi. I was, so my name's Kyle, um, and I was hoping that you would talk about at least your process or process on uh, with judges and law clerks. So like what would you look for in a clerk coming out of law school or mm -hmm. other other justices have looked for? So what, what we look for in our clerks are, are high academic achievement, um, that they've maybe done some research for a professor. Having a recommendation from a professor is really strong because, you know, if you've done, worked as a research assistant for a professor, that's a strong endorsement. Um, you wouldn't get this on a state Supreme Court, but for example, if you were going to clerk on the fed a federal court, they're going to look primarily at what activities are you involved in, academic rigor, recommendations from professors. The same thing with the Ohio Supreme Court. A federal court might look for prior clerkships, um, which on the Supreme Court you wouldn't have unless you had the opportunity perhaps to extern. In law school now, you can get a law school credit for doing what we call an externship. So you can go extern in a justice's or a, ju a federal judge's chambers and get law school credit, it's a pass-fail class. That can get you a leg up when you go to apply for clerkships too, particularly if you wanna get into the federal system, you know, clerking for a judge on the federal district court as an extern and having that judge write a letter of recommendation for you when you're applying for clerkships goes a long way. But it's first and foremost academic rigor. I will tell you at Jones Day and when we were at the Supreme Court, we really are interviewing the top 10% of the class. It's a small slice. So when I go out to interview people, you're looking at kids being separated by tenths of a point. You know what gets you into that top 10% gets you those interviews. And we have interview criteria because if you talk to our managing partner, he would say, what we sell is our brand. And our brand is intellectual heft, academic rigor. And so if you're in that elite field, then you're gonna get the opportunities for clerkship. If you're in the 50% the of your class, no matter what law school you come from, it's gonna be harder to get those clerkships. Oh, good. Uh, I wanted to know, you having spent so many years in the public sector, no thank you, um, <laughs> if you personally have been bogged down by the political aspect, if throughout all the time that you were working in the public sphere, if it ever felt like it was too much, like you weren't getting through or you weren't accomplishing what you wanted to mm -hmm. because of the pressures of government. Hmm. Interesting question. I will say that um, no, I, I didn't feel the pressures of politics. And I'll give you two different um, scenarios. When I was a trial court judge, so I was a domestic relations and juvenile court judge on the common pleas court. I was on that court for nine years. And the reason I left wasn't because of politics or government, but I felt bogged down by the depravity I saw every day. I mean, when you are a judge, when you are a trial court judge, you can't imagine some of the things that come before you. There is um, a depravity out there. I mean, people do horrible things to other people. They allow horrible things to be done to their children. And literally after nine years, I had had enough. And that's when I started looking for something else to do. And people thought I was crazy. Chip was like, why are you leaving? I mean, people said to me, you could be a judge forever. 
But I didn't want to anymore because it was starting to change who I was. I couldn't leave it at the office anymore. And the pivotal moment um, was when I came home one day and my daughter, who was then 14, um, wanted to go to a party. And I was like, go to a party? Who's having the party? And she's like, oh, some kid at school. Well, what's his parents' name? I don't know his parents' name, Mom. It's just a party. Well, I need to know who this kid is, who his parents are. About. She's like, Mom, it's just a party. He's not a bad kid. And I said, really? Really? I had a 15-year-old in my court today who was gang raped on a pool table. You think she knew that was going to happen? And my husband's like, back it down. Back it down. <laughs> he looked at my daughter. He's like, you can go to the party you got to get some perspective. And so, <laughs> so for me, that was one of those pivotal moments when I said, okay, I can't parent in this way. I can't wrap my kids in a bubble because every day I see these horrible things that happen and it makes me afraid for them to walk down the street. So that was one thing. On the Supreme Court, as much as we say that the judicial branch should not be political, and I do not believe we are political, we run for election, which means you have to raise money from people who have vested interests in who sits on the court. And so part of the process, I just didn't care for. Because you're trying to tell people that they should vote for you because you're highly recommended by every bar association that has interviewed you. You've been endorsed by every newspaper in the state. You have a long career of legal accomplishments and business accomplishments. But at the end of the day, it boils down to whether you're going to be on their side or the other side. That's the distasteful part. And I'll give you an example of where I had to say to um, some union leaders who are traditionally Democratic supporters, I had to say to them that when I raised my hand, I took an oath to the Constitution, not to the Ohio Democratic Party. Because I walked in to meet with some union leaders and one of them said, we're upset with you. And I said, why? You voted to allow them to referend on the, afford on the President's Health Care Act? I said, yes, I did. Well, why would you do that? And I said, well, do you remember when I walked in here earlier and you said you were so happy that the court had allowed some other issue to go forward on referendum? He goes, yes. And I said, same Constitution. Ohio's Constitution favors referendum. We don't get to decide the issue. Ohio's Constitution favors referendum. That's why we voted to allow the president's health care law to go on the ballot. He looked at me like, like nobody had ever said that to him before. He goes, oh, all right, OK. And that was it. I mean, I don't ever have, so, so yes, that part of it is a little distasteful. I don't want anybody challenging me on my votes. You can disagree with me if you want, but I'm not going to vote for you because I happen to be a Democrat. My job is to apply the law. And as long as I felt like I did that every day, I would have stayed on the court. And I had no problem telling people, look, you don't like my decisions, don't vote for me. But don't think because you support me, you're getting a thumb on the scale. I'm going to call the law like I see it. And I, I actually had a, a young college student in Cleveland come to me. At, she was, we were at a rally, and she said, my friends say that you vote like a Republican. I said, what does that mean? All of your votes seem to be with the Republicans. And I said, well, the Republicans been writing the law in this state for 20-some years. So if it looks like I'm voting like a Republican, it's because that's what the law says. You want a different vote? Change the law. I think you have to have that kind of strength and integrity if you're going to serve in political office. So that's the long answer to your question. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Justice Brown, thank you for coming up. Absolutely. My name's Chuck Dias. I'm an OU 81 grad. Oh, good. Somebody from my generation. I'm 82. We, were, we must have crossed paths <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Um, All these kids now who go, I graduated in 2003. Right. I said, 2014? <laughs> I can't get my head around that. I don't know. Anyway, um, thank you for interacting with students today. This is great. A couple other uh, words of advice I'm asking you to give to them is yeah. one, one about mentors, your own mentors. Yes. 
uh, Judge Jackson and yes. others who you've encountered through the years, and also community service, because yes. both of us have encountered both those, and those are great strengths that you yes. have to have. Thank so you. So if you could just give a little advice on that would be great. Thank you. Absolutely. So I, I think those are both good points. Com um, having a mentor becomes very important. I've, I've started to say recently, not just a mentor, but a sponsor as you start your career. I mean, my mentor was um, Janet Jackson, who, not the singer Janet Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> but um, a woman named Janet Jackson, who was a lawyer at the Attorney General's office, and she was actually a section chief and one of the people who interviewed me when I was applying for a job at the Attorney General's office when I was in law school, and we just hit it off. And she became, from that point in 1985 till today, one of my closest friends. But she was my mentor and in many ways my sponsor when she said to me, I had, um, she was tough too. I mean, Janet's not anybody who's gonna, you know, sugarcoat things. And so what happens is you take the bar exam the last week of July, but you typically don't find out till the last week of October if you passed it. So there's all this anxiety and I would go into her office and I'd go in there and say, oh my God, I know I failed, I didn't pass. And she wouldn't even look at me. She'd be like, you passed, now get the hell out of my office. Her warm and fuzzy. But the best advice that she gave to me was, she asked me once whether I was involved in the community, and I said, what do you mean? She said, well, are you doing any volunteer work? And I said, no. And she said, it is not okay for you to just go to work and go home. You need to get involved in your community. You need to do something. Find something you're passionate about, and then go do it. And so I went out, and I got involved with United Way, and then uh, with this organization called Friends of the Homeless. I started serving on their board because I'd grown up with people that had housing instability. And so from there, I just took off on community service. I found that I loved it, and it was a great balance to what I did every day because when you're a lawyer, the days can be stressful, they can be long, they can be hard. But then when you leave there and you go work in a soup kitchen or you help fold clothes for people that are homeless and everything they have is in a garbage bag, it really gives your life perspective and it gives you balance. The other thing it does, though, is that I got to meet people that I would have never interacted with but for my community service. And so when I say have a sponsor, one of the great people that became not only my friend but my sponsor and my mentor was Abigail Wexner. She's the wife of the, the chairman of L Brands, Les Wexner, and she and I met through community service. And while I was on the bench, after I had this meltdown with my daughter, I happened to be at her house a couple of weeks later, and I was telling her how I needed to find something else to do. And she said, well, you know, Children's Hospital is thinking about building this child abuse center, this one-stop program. Would you ever think about doing something like that? And from there, a whole new path opened for me. But I wouldn't have been successful. It wasn't just enough that she was my mentor. She was the one who was willing to tell the hospital I was the right person, to be there as my counsel and as my partner as we got this nonprofit launch, to help me think through critically what kind of services we would provide, how did we want this model to exist, to help me bring partners to the table, to get the prosecutor and the sheriff and the police department and children services, all of them working cooperatively in the center. She was my advocate, my sponsor, my mentor. Those people are hugely important to you in your life. All of you as students have probably had those people in your life now, people who've given you good advice, people who've opened doors for you. I want to encourage you to listen to those people, to really take that hand that's extended to you. Sandra Haggerty is somebody who has been in my life from that day in 1980 when she suggested I go to law school. She was at my wedding. She just sent me a, a note. <laughs> a note and a program uh, after she retired from the university two summers ago. I shouldn't tell you this because I'm going to live to regret it. But um, I was Miss Bronze 1980. And she, <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> so she sent me the program from 1980. <laughs> and she said, oh my God, when were we ever this young? <laughs> but it's people like that that you meet along the way. Nobody, unless you're born with a silver spoon in your mouth, and now I think it has to be platinum, not just silver, but nobody 
gets to success on their own. Look for those people in your life who are people who encourage you, who challenge you, who mentor and sponsor you, and then do things that are outside yourself. Now, I will tell you, when you're in law school, if you go to law school, you are only to do law school until your third year. Your first two years' grades are extremely important. Your third year, rock it out. It's like your senior year of college. Your applications are submitted, you're in. Don't worry about that. But you do need to look for things that make your heart sing. Look for things that give you purpose. Don't just do it for the money. Do it because it makes you feel like you're making a difference, that it mattered that you lived on this earth. Thank you for allowing me to say that. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, at 6 o'clock. Good luck to you in law school. I hope to see you. Jones Day is a great law firm. <laughs> Top 10%. <laughs> Thanks.